so thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Um, so just to quickly introduce myself, my name's uh, Tom Rainfall. I'm a, a senior research fellow in Oxford, uh, where I run a group uh, doing a, a variety of things in uh, probabilistic machine learning. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there in person today. Um, I had a bit of a, a COVID scare and I may, uh, it's not clear, but I may well have COVID at the moment. So I thought uh, it was better to um, stay away. One, one second, I think the sound quality is not very clear. Let me try to see if I can improve this. Um, okay. Yeah, I think this is too high, no? Uh, can you try to say, try to say, to say something? Yeah, can you, can you hear me any better now? Better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, our volume was too high. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. You can continue now. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, sorry, uh, hopefully you can hear me better now. Um, so, yeah, I was just saying, um, I'm sorry I'm not there in uh, person. Uh, I just had a bit of a COVID scare. Um, and so, I'm going to be talking today about uh, Bayesian uh, experimental design. And uh, if we have time later, I'll also go on uh, to talk about uh, Bayesian active learning. So, uh, the design of experiments is, is pretty ubiquitous. So all of science and a lot of this industry is really based uh, around doing experiments. And naturally, sort of how we set those experiments up um, is really going to matter. And so we have this kind of fundamental challenge from everything to the sort of clinical trials to, to physical experiments uh, to things like online surveys about how we actually set them up um, to sort of make them as informative as possible uh, and gonna get the best data from them. So we essentially, whenever we do an experiment, we're, we're trying to gather data and we wanna look about how we can kind of gather um, data from those experiments. So when we do machine learning, we do all of this stuff about how we use that data um, when, when, once we've got it. But what this talk's gonna be about is, is the fact that we can also be actually be quantitative and use machine learning tools in the gathering of that data as well. We can actually be very clever about how we get that data and make sure we get good um, quality um, data in uh, out of our experiments. So we want to use sort of tools from statistics as well, tools from machine learning to do this kind of experimental design. And we want to make this into a sort of a quantitative science. I'm going to be arguing that the, the, the process of designing effective experiments can actually be very much made uh, into a quantitative process. And then we should be bringing a lot of the tools uh, and a lot of the knowledge that we have uh, to bear to do those uh, in the most effective possible way. Um, obviously, the, the benefits for this should, should be pretty obvious. So if, if we get good data, we get better data, um, then we're going to have better models that are trained on those, and all the sort of machine learning gets better, um, the better data we can get. Uh, and so I think it's a really kind of important fundamental problem uh, to be getting this right. So to give a, a bit of a sort of a context and sort of formalize a bit uh, what I mean, uh, I'm going to sort of give a bit of a definition for an experiment process, uh, and then I'm going to start to build out from there. So I'm going to argue that basically um, experimentation is about choosing designs. Um, so I'm going to call these things chi. So we've got this, this uh, thing chi, and that's going to sort of be um, denoting the, these controllable variables. So a design is things in an experiment that we control, the things we set up uh, when we start the experiment. Um, so if, if we're doing like a survey, it's going to kind of be the questions we ask in that survey. Uh, if it's a physical experiment, it's going to be how, how we set our apparatus up some kind of simulation it's the sort of configuration uh, of that simulation but it's the thing we're making choices about it's the thing we're controlling and we have to make choices about and once we've made those choices once we've got design um, running experiment is i'm going to presume some sort of stochastic process uh, even if it's sort of uh, deterministic uh, under the hood um, we're going to treat it as stochastic because we wouldn't be running it uh, if we knew everything it was going to to do and most of the time it is going to be um, truly stochastic and there's going to be some sort of distribution for that. So we're going to have some kind of outputs Y, uh, and they're going to have some conditional uh, distribution given our designs. Uh, there's going to be some sort of true underlying distribution. We, of course, generally don't know that in most cases, um, but um, there will be some sort of underlying distribution. Uh, in any experiment, there's obviously other things that might be there. We might have covariates, nuisance variables, uh, or even sort of fixed inputs that we're not um, directly controlling. Um, but I'm going to argue that we can generally sort of shove all of these into that sort of output process. So unless we're controlling them, they don't affect uh, how we're going to make our decisions. They only affect it 
uh, or, or more precisely, they only affect it through uh, the distribution of outcomes given in inputs. Uh, and so I'm going to just sort of collapse a away a lot of the notation we might have from things like these covariants uh, into this true sort of distribution um, on outputs given inputs. Once we've then actually gone and run things, um, we're going to have to have some sort of uh, utility uh, that says how good our experiment was. Uh, so in the same way that in, in sort of normal machine learning, we have a loss function for predictions, uh, we want a utility function that's going to measure how good the experiment is once we've run it. And that's naturally going to be a, a function of our designs um, and the outcomes. So, uh, so together, that, that sort of uh, design and the outcome is the data we've obtained. That sort of pairing is going to form our data. And the utility we get um, from the experiment is going to be a function of that data. Now, that utility might take different forms. Um, in, For example, it might be some sort of notion of fairness in a lot of modern systems. We might want to get as fair data as possible for predictions. Uh, it might, in some sort of causal models, uh, have some particular things for sort of underlying causal reasoning. Uh, but the main way I'm going to be thinking about it is, is through the eyes of information. And we're going to be looking at good experiments as experiments that return a lot of information. And I'm going to be formalizing um, what that means as we go along. Given this sort of general uh, notion of an experimental process, uh, the problem of experimental design is now simply that of choosing the designs. We're setting those controllable parts of the experiment. We're optimizing them to get the best uh, possible setup um, of uh, those design variables. And we're going to do that by sort of optimizing uh, something to do with the utility function. So that utility function uh, is a function of the thing we're optimizing the design and the outputs. So we can't deal with it directly. Uh, but what we will usually do is deal with this expectation. So in the same way that sort of conventional machine learning, uh, we don't really deal with losses, but expectations of losses, we deal with risks. Here, we're going to look at the expectation um, of that utility function, where that expectation is over these outcomes. So we can say that we're trying to find this kind of chi-star, which is the argmax under possible designs of the expectation of this utility function. So to give you an idea of, of what this is going to kind of look like, we can consider a, a very simple um, possible experiment. So um, this is these are actually real experiments. I, I used to work with a psychologist, and he's very interested in how people subjectively value money um, under sort of delays um, to that. So he's looking at sort of subjective values under delays. And he'll ask people questions like, would you prefer 60 pounds today or 100 pounds in a year? And what he wants to do is figure out good questions to ask people, because he's actually often giving them the actual money in these questions. And so they've got to be as good questions as possible so that he can learn as much about their underlying behaviors as he can uh, with as few questions and as little um, money as possible. So here, there's sort of two questions he might ask. Uh, so he might choose to ask, would you prefer 60 pounds a day or 100 pounds in a year? Or he might ask, would you prefer 200 pounds a day or 100 pounds in a year? And it should be pretty obvious that the first of these is a better um, sort of simple experiment than the second, uh, because almost everyone for the second, or possibly even everyone for the second, is going to say they prefer the larger sum of money now. Um, and so when we ask that, we know that the response people are going to give is that they want the money today. Whereas with the first question, there may be some good variability uh, in the people we're asking the questions. And it's a much more pertinent, pertinent experiment uh, that will hopefully give us uh, a lot more um, information. So in terms of formalizing this, we could kind of make this into a quantitative thing by saying, uh, well, we're going to keep, say, the amount of money we give them in a year fixed, but maybe instead um, vary the amount of money we might offer them today. So here, this chi, this design variable, is going to just represent the amount of money we're giving today. And so our optimization problem becomes just a question of optimizing um, that variable chi, the amount of money uh, we're going to offer today. And as we've seen, it's quite clear that with those two questions, the offering of £60 today uh, is a much more sensible question. It's a much better design than £200 today. And because it's going to give us much more information. And uh, if we say had a drug addict um, and some sort of professor that's about to retire, they're both likely to sort of take the £200 now over those two options. Uh, but we generally probably expect the drug addict to take the £60 now uh, and the professor to take the £100 uh, in a year because they have this different information, they have these different behaviors, and it's those behaviors we're trying to learn about. 
So we intuitively have this idea that the second experiment is a much better experiment. But we need to sort of have a way of formalizing that. We need some formalization of why is the second experiment better um, than this first experiment uh, in, in some sort of quantitative um, formal manner. And the way we're going to be doing that in this talk is looking at what's called Bayesian experimental design, or sometimes BED uh, for short. And what Bayesian experimental design is, is, is a framework for this formalization. It gives us a mechanism for actually formalizing what is an optimal experiment, how good an experiment is. It's going to give us essentially a utility function uh, that we can work with uh, to decide how good an experiment is. And it's going to do that through the eyes of information theory. So it's going to be quite formalized into sort of informations and talking about the gain of information. And it's going to turn out that basically we're going to choose experiments that in expectation return the most information. And we're going to formalize what that means um, in that information, that formalize that notion of information. Uh, the basis for all of this is, as you might expect, given it's called Bayesian experiment design, uh, a probabilistic or a Bayesian um, generative model, and that's going to model possible outcomes of the experiment um, given um, possible designs, and as we'll see in a sec, um, things we're trying to learn about as well. And what we'll do is we'll use that model as a mechanism to formalizing this notion of information. So it will turn out that once we have this model, once we have an absolute explicit model, we can use that model as a mechanism for formalizing information we can use that formalization of information to formalize the notion of experiment optimality. Where this will really start to get interesting is when we don't just think about this as running a single experiment, uh, but when we think about it as running a series of experiments. So in that sort of uh, experiment before, where we're asking these people questions. We're not likely to just ask them a single question. We want to ask them lots of questions so that we can sort of get more information uh, and get more insight into how um, they're going to be behaving. And we want to do that in a clever way. So as we learn about the participant and we learn uh, that say they really like having money now, we're not going to ask them questions along the lines of um, small sort of differences of money in a, a long way away or a, a compared to a small uh, increase in money, uh, sorry, a small uh, depreciation of money now. So we're not going to look at small differences if we know they discount uh, a large amount. We're going to try and sort of make sure our questions are pertinent and sort of tailored uh, to the particular person we're running uh, the experiment with. And what that means is we're going to want a mechanism for adapting experiments. We want to take information we're getting as we go, as we learn information from previous responses. We want to use that to guide the future uh, experiment iterations. And we can do that again with this, this BED, this Bayesian Experiment Design Framework. And we can actually use it to formalize adaptive experiments uh, they're going to be mechanisms uh, that learn as you go. Before I go into sort of talking about it in a bit more detail, it, it's worth pointing out though that you probably will have all seen some notion of Bayesian experiment design because I think uh, Bayesian optimization has already been sort of covered uh, in the summer school. And it turns out Bayesian optimization is actually a special case uh, of this Bayesian experimental design. And another common case is, is Bayesian active learning. Uh, and so it, it's a weird case where the sort of the general notion of Bayesian experiment design is actually sort of less famous um, than a couple uh, of its specific instances. Uh, but hopefully a lot of the, what we'll go through is actually of, of quite big relevance um, to those other topics as well. Uh, and it, it's this sort of more generalized notion uh, of working uh, with information. So to give things a, a, a bit more formalism again and sort of really start to look at exactly what's going on, we can say that in a, in a Bayesian experiment design, uh, there are sort of three things we're dealing with. So we have the same notion of design and outcome from before. So the design being the things we're controlling, the outcome being what's coming uh, out of the experiment when we run it. But we also have uh, in a Bayesian experiment design a notion of um, some variable we want to learn about. So we're going to call this theta at the top right, and it's some sort of latent uh, or some sort of real thing that we're trying to learn about. So in, in the example we've been running with, it would be some sort of parameters in a model that model how people behave uh, and how they're going to answer the question. So it's, it's sort of specific parameters to each person who we're experimenting with about how they will behave uh, and how they're likely to respond. And as in general, it's just whatever we're trying to learn about. So it can actually be very abstract. Uh, it can be sort of things that we're going to later predict. It can be future predictions. Uh, in Bayesian optimization, it will actually be the location of the optimum. 
So it can be a very abstract notion, but it's something that we're trying to learn about and uh, we're going to work with. And the only other assumption is that we're going to be able to have some kind of modeling of outcomes based um, on that information. So we have to have some way of linking that thing we're trying to learn about with what's going to come um, out of the experiment. And that's where the, sort of the Bayesian model itself comes in. So we're going to assume there's some prior on the thing we're trying to learn about. We have some information about it. We have some kind of entropy as well. We know about um, that. And that's going to be the prior distribution on what we're trying to learn about. And we have some simulator or likelihood for model outcomes um, given designs and those latents. So again, this, this isn't something that necessarily is to encapsulate everything in the experimental process. There may be covariates and other things in there. Uh, and it may account for them, it may not account for them, uh, but it's just got to be some kind of model that takes us from what we learn about and our designs um, to those outcomes. In the normal way, these will, of course, um, implicitly define a posterior. We have, by Bayes' rule, uh, that a posterior um, on uh, what we're trying to learn about is proportional to the prior times the likelihood. And essentially what we're going to be doing is trying to get as good posteriors as possible. We're going to be sort of targeting good properties of those posteriors through our choices of the designs. And what we can say is that the general goal with BAD is to choose designs so that we gather data that is informative as possible about this unknown latent theta. So we want data that will basically tell us as much information as it can about whatever we're trying to learn about. And we're going to formalize what that information is. And we're going to then try and optimize the design to maximize um, that information. And that formalization is actually reasonably simple. Um, we can call something the information gain. Uh, so the information gain is very simply the reduction in entropy on our parameters. So before we run the experiment, our entropy was given by the entropy of the prior. So we have some degree of uncertainty about our parameters before we do anything. Once we run the experiment, we'll have this posterior. That posterior will have some kind of entropy, some kind of uncertainty. And the information gain is simply the difference between these two terms. It's the amount of information we've learned. It's a reduction in uncertainty um, by running um, the experiment. So we've got that the, this data is conveying some information about theta, and it's measuring the amount of information uh, that data is conveying uh, about theta. And if we go back to our example, we can kind of see uh, how that plays out in that um, if we have some sort of model and we ask this person 200 pounds a day or 100 pounds in a year, they're always going to say 200 pounds now. And so there'll be very little change between our prior and our posterior. We, we've learned very little about theta uh, because we knew that that response was coming. Um, but when we ask them if you want 60 pounds today or 100 pounds in a year, and they say they want 100 pounds later, that tells us a lot more information about that person. Uh, posterior on the sort of parameters of that person uh, have a much lower entropy than the, uh, we did pr uh, a priori. And therefore, we have this reduction uh, in information. So it's probably just a, a good point to have a, a, a quick um, pause for, for questions, uh, given the, the Zoom. Uh, I think, is there anyone got any questions? Any questions uh, so far? Uh, yeah, one moment. Sorry, I can hear some talking, but I can't hear what's been said. Can you hear us? Oh, I can, yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, very interesting. And uh, since we're in the middle of the talk, I'm not sure if you'll get to this, but I find this really interesting because I haven't seen this data in economics too much when I was studying it in my undergrad, uh, and it does seem very useful. One thing I'm wondering about is uh, how well um, these models that we uh, fit to the data to then know where to sample, how well they um, uh, map to sort of the functions that are underlying the data generating process. So, for instance, um, how well behaved are people's 
preferences uh, really and are there sort of like strong non-linearities or sort of like uh, effects that are quite complicated that are hard uh, to model and how much does it depend on also how we transform our data so for instance like uh, whether we use uh, log money or log utility instead of uh, uh, linear money um, yes uh, so, uh, so uh, I, I'm probably not the best person to ask this too precisely because I'm not actually a psychologist myself, but the, my understanding is the models are actually pretty crude um, that they use. So the, the, the understanding is, is usually not so great. Um, but remember that ultimately what we're trying to aim to do here is, is, is to get good data. So the, there isn't necessarily a dependency on absolutely this being exactly the right model for us to get good data out of it. It just needs to kind of be a model that is helpful that needs to be better than just sort of randomly um, choosing things. So the, the ultimate aim is, is, is going to be that sort of data acquisition usually. Um, and so it can still be useful when the model model is a bit crude. And the, the other thing to, to say here is that um, if, if people are going to sort of post hoc use the same model, um, you're also kind of getting it for free. So uh, in, in a lot of these scenarios, you, you are using the same model and it isn't just data acquisition. And, and in those scenarios, um, you, you sort of might as well be doing something with this, even if your model is quite bad, because you're kind of ultimately using that model anyway, and you're still getting as much information as you can within the context of that model. Um, so that there are certainly issues with, with model misspecification and, 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 and things uh, that, that can occur uh, that I probably won't go into because they're, they're a bit deeper, but uh, in, in principle, you're not reliant on, on, on everything being perfect uh, for, for this to be useful. Uh, Tom, we're going to try to see if changing the audio system improves things a bit. Uh, um, okay. Can you try to say something now? Uh, yeah, can, can you hear? Uh, am I still quite in the clear? Uh, now? Yeah, uh, can you hear me better? Yeah, it's the same. Uh, and uh, now? Uh, trying again? No. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> this is the best we can do. Uh, Okay, uh, good. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to ask uh, anything else. Uh, no, should we continue then? Uh, I think we can, we can continue. Cool, sounds good. Um, okay, so we formalized this notion of, of like an information we're gaining. We have a model, that model gives us some notion of, of, of how good it is in terms of how much information we've gained. Um, but that thing is still a function itself of the outcomes and we don't know uh, those outcomes. So in practice, what we need to do uh, is we deal with what's known as the expected information gain. Um, so we can think about this information gain as this kind of utility function, and then we're going to work uh, with the expectation uh, of that utility function. We get this expectation of information gain over um, possible outcomes. So ideally, we want that expectation to be taken with respect to the true uh, distribution and outcomes, but we, of course, do not know that. But what we can do is we can kind of use our model twice. So we can take that expectation as the expectation as predicted by our model. So essentially this thing is our marginal likelihood. This PY given chi is the marginal uh, likelihood. It's the expectation of the likelihood under the prior. In other words, it's sort of the prior predictive distribution essentially uh, in this context. Uh, and we can use that as a mechanism to predict possible outcomes. And this then gives us a single uh, objective that is now just a function um, of our designs and by doing this and using this model twice we can go and we can choose designs um, by optimizing uh, this expected information gain as our objective and it turns out this actually has a lot of uh, different interesting interpretations so we've just gone through it and this notion of information gain and it's been the expected information gain uh, but it's equal to a lot of other terms that you uh, might see uh, elsewhere as well so it turns out it's exactly equal to the mutual information uh, between parameters and outcomes. So it's the mutual information uh, between y and theta. So that's given by the expectation, the joint of y and theta, of log of the joint density over the product of the marginals. And again, we see here the need for a model. To have some sort of mutual information, you need some sort of model um, for those distributions. And given those 
uh, mo that model for the distributions that defines this mutual information for us. So it's this mutual information under that model um, between these two things. Another way to view it is we can look at it as the expected um, KL divergence between the prior and the posterior. So we're trying to maximize the divergence from the prior to the posterior. We're trying to sort of get designs uh, that give us data that will maximize the difference in how much we change our beliefs. So we're having a maximal change um, in our beliefs. Thirdly, and in some ways most interestingly, um, we can also look at it as the expected reduction in predictive uncertainty. So we can also define it as the expectation under the joint of the log uh, predictive density uh, given theta, so the log likelihood minus the sort of log marginal likelihood not given theta. Um, so here we're looking at sort of essentially how much does our predictive uncertainty change if we knew theta. If we knew the thing we're trying to learn about, how much would it help in making predictions for the output of the experiment? And that will actually vary depending on the designs. So if we have something where knowing theta was really informative to know the outcomes of experiments for that particular design, that actually tells you have a very large expected information gain from running with that design. In other words, good designs are ones where our parameters are actually really informative and bad designs are ones where our parameters will not be very informative. So just to sort of reiterate here, these three things are all exactly equal to the EIG. And they're actually quite simple to, to sort of derive. It's just a question of uh, using Bayes rule and some, some simple manipulations. Uh, but they're sort of, they crop up very differently in different literatures. So the, the, this last one comes up all the time in sort of active learning. Um, you get sort of the top one mutual information comes across in uh, contrastive learning all the time. Um, and so you see that they sort of come up in different fields, uh, but they're all these sort of equivalent concepts uh, that we can move between. So to try and give a, a, a bit clearer an example of how this is uh, going to work, um, I'm going to go a bit more carefully through a particular example uh, based on some location finding. Uh, so we have a problem where we know there are sort of two sources of some kind of signal, and we're trying to relocate uh, those, um, so we're trying to locate where that signal is coming from. So we have here that theta is the location of two signal sources, so if theta 1 is some position here, theta 2 is some other position, and theta is the concatenation of the two. And our design is choosing where to measure that signal. We can only uh, measure it in a sort of finite number of places. And so our design is just figuring out where we're going to measure um, the position of the signal. And our outcome is going to be the strength that we actually measure. So here we might be trying to, to measure the signal in this place. We get quite a weak um, signal, it turns out, if we measure it here. If we now want to put this in a Bayesian experimental design framework, the first thing we need to do is to, to construct some sort of prior on where those sources might be. We have some kind of prior information about where the sources could be. Um, so if we don't know anything, we might just put some sort of Gaussian like we've done here on each of the locations. Uh, but if we already have some information of those sources, we could put some other distribution uh, that's maybe uh, a bit more informative. But in general, we're encapsulating our sort of prior beliefs of where um, those sources might be. We then, of course, need a likelihood or equivalently a, a simulator um, for um, where uh, sorry, a simulator for what signal we might get uh, given a particular position. Uh, and for this problem, we could use sort of an inverse square law and then superimpose the two signals. Um, so we might have, say, a log uh, normal distribution on the signal strength at the bottom. And the mean uh, of that log normal we might take uh, by using the sort of inverse square law. So we might have that this mu parameter is, is B, uh, which for some constant B plus the sum over the two sources, one over some other parameter that's fixed m uh, plus our squared uh, distance from the source. Uh, so this gives us some uh, sort of simulator. It may not be the exact true process um, for um, the sort of actual observations we see, but it is some uh, model um, for uh, what we're going to see. And we can use this model um, for doing a design process, which means choosing uh, where to actually evaluate the signal. So given this prior and this likelihood, um, we know through Bayes that we've got uh, a margin likelihood defined in a posterior. So we might need some computation to get these, but they are explicitly and uniquely defined um, given our choice of our prior and our likelihood. And so uh, given any design observation pairs, we know that posterior and we know uh, that marginal distribution if uh, we ignore any computational considerations. And that means that we actually have everything we need um, to actually perform the adaptive, uh, sorry, perform the design process. Um, so the EIG, uh, we know 
and this, this posterior. If we can do the computation, we know this prior and we know this marginal. So we know all of these terms. And we have that the CIG is this sort of global thing that tells us what to do in a Bayesian model. And this is quite cool because it's, it's kind of got a universality to it like Bayes rule does in the sense that as soon as we've got our model, we know exactly how to sort of um, choose the best designs in that model. It, it's a uniqueness on the best designs for um, a particular model setup. And it's given as this framework in this formalization. And in principle, we now have kind of everything we need uh, to go and actually choose those designs and therefore perform experimental design. However, there is two pretty glaring and obvious problems with this. Um, the first is that it's unlikely that we're just going to take one observation. So here, um, it, it, we've just been sort of parameterizing this by a single observation, which is unlikely to be realistic. We're going to need multiple um, observations to actually sort of uncover the source. And ideally, we'd actually want to do that adaptively. We don't want to choose up front all the positions we're going to measure the signal. We want to use the early measurements to help um, with the later measurements uh, and adapt our process. And the second very clear uh, outstanding issue is that of computation. Um, actually, having these things is going to require often quite substantial computation uh, to do in practice. So we all know uh, Bayesian inference for most problems is, is quite difficult. And it's going to turn out doing this sort of um, EIG estimation is going to be far more difficult. It's actually going to be way worse uh, than just normal posterior inference. And so it's actually going to turn out as a massive sort of computational burden um, to trying to do this. Uh, but I'm going to first go and, and talk about this first problem. We're going to first talk about this need uh, for multiple experiments. And we'll come back uh, to this computational thing uh, a little bit later. So what we want here is, is we want some notion of an adaptive experiment. Um, we want something where at each iteration, we're utilizing information we've already gained and utilizing that to make better decisions. So it's going to be kind of like a sort of a detective honing in on a suspect where as we learn more about them, we, we ask more and more pertinent questions and we sort of probe better and better. Or in our location finding, as, as we sort of get some idea of where the signal is, we move closer and closer and closer to the signal um, so we can better and better uh, figure out exactly where um, it's coming from. And in doing this, most sort of adaptive experimentation is, is going to follow uh, this sort of the same kind of uh, free um, processes. So we've got this notion of choosing a design as we've already got, and this is going to be some sort of optimization of, of some kind of objective function. So I'm just using f, but it's just some sort of arbitrary objective, uh, and that's going to be a function of whatever design we choose, and also the history we've seen so far. So this history is is a notion of the data already. So we've got ht is all the previous um, design outcome pairs up to time t. So ht minus one is the data essentially we've already seen when we're making the teeth uh, design decision. And so between these two things uh, and whatever we've got in our model and whatever we've uh, constructed, that should be all the information we need uh, to go and make uh, that design decision. Once we've chosen the design, we of course run the experiment. So here uh, we would go and say, get the strength of the signal source. That will actually come from whatever underlying true distribution there is. We say go and ask the participant a real question or, or something. So there'll be some true underlying thing that will give us a response. And then we have this key third step, which is that we need to incorporate the information we've learned. So before we get to the next iteration, we need to update things in some way or other um, to sort of incorporate that information. We need to in, um, embed it into our model and use that information so that the next design decision um, is more pertinent uh, and better. And what this will end up looking like uh, in our location finding is a bit like this. Um, so here on the left is a very simple sort of just random design strategy. So here we've just chosen a random set of points. Uh, we've evaluated their signal strength uh, and uh, we don't really learn too much uh, about the sources because they're not sort of uh, particularly well distributed. In the middle is something where we kind of up front choose all of our locations. So before we actually uh, inquire about the signal strength anywhere, we're just going to a priori choose exactly all the places um, we're going to go and inquire about. Uh, and we can do this quite simply by in, in a Bayesian experiment design by just sort of stacking variables. We could say, instead of my design being one location, I could define uh, my design to be, say, 20 locations, uh, and my outcomes to be the corresponding 20 um, different signal strengths. And I can just have a one big joint model of all of those and optimize uh, the expected information gain uh, across all 20 uh, locations at the same time, 
but it won't give us this adaptation. It's this static process uh, where even though it sort of nicely spreads the points, uh, it's still not sort of utilizing information it's learning. However, if we take some adaptive process on the right, what we see is that the adaptive process spends way more of its time in the regions just around um, those signals. It's learning where those signals are. So it, it has some bad uh, examples initially on, but then it's learned from those bad examples and then has a lot uh, of examples right where it needs to be. And it will have learned a lot better exactly how to do it. So we want this adaptive process is taking information as we go. And we can computationally do that uh, quite easily in, in the Bayesian experiment design framework, at, at least in theory, um, because we can define what's known as the conditional EIG, the conditional expected information gain. Uh, and that all, sorry, all that requires is just to replace the prior with that old posterior. So essentially, if we condition everything on the history, it's the same thing as taking our old prior and instead of uh, just using the prior without any data, we use the posterior from the previous step as our prior at the next step. And this is kind of the same thing you usually do in Bayesian inference. So you've got this consistency in Bayesian inference. That if I condition on one new data point uh, with the prior as the posterior condition on all the other data points, it's the same thing as conditioning all at the same time. And it's the same thing of adding in data points one by one. In other words, what we get is we get the expectation on the conditional distribution of outputs given designs uh, and all the history so far of the difference in the posterior entropy um, from the t minus one iteration to the t iteration. So we have the entropy of p theta given the history of the time t minus one minus the entropy of theta given the history of time t, or in other words, uh, the entropy of uh, theta given the history of t minus one, the new design, at the new outcome. And, and this, we're again, we're using our model um, to define this outer expectation. We want that to really be the true expectation that we take over true possible outcomes. If we don't know it, we again double use our model. We use our model um, to define that expectation itself, uh, and we use it, therefore, um, to sort of uh, draw samples, for example, uh, to look at possible simulations. So we're simulating, essentially, from our model, and then we're using those simulations from the model to look at the information gain from one step to the next, and we're taking expectation over all of those simulations. And what that gives us uh, when we iterate it is, is a sort of a traditional uh, adaptive VAD process. It's, I'm going to come back and explain why actually you can also call this the greedy uh, adaptive VAD process because there are actually other ways we'll find we can do this as well. But this is the way that it was it was done uh, by everyone pretty much until, until uh, four or five years ago. Uh, and it just basically iterates through the same process using these terms. So the design step is going to just optimize this condition EIG. So we're going to choose designs by optimizing this term here, this conditional EIG. Uh, and we've got these, if we have sort of running posterior estimates, uh, we can go and try and estimate this guy in the same way. And we can use this to choose uh, a design at each step. Once we've got that, we simulate the experiment. We run the experiment in the normal way by drawing uh, from the true distribution. And then again, we have this inference process. Uh, but what we've done here is we, we're now formally defining this inference process as an updating of our posterior approximation. So each iteration, we have our posterior given the history so far, HT, and that will be generally proportional to the prior times the product of the likelihood so far. So we're making the normal kind of Bayesian assumption that the likelihood factorizes. And if that's true, then we have that the posterior given everything so far is the prior times the product of the likelihoods. So each time we update, we're essentially adding in one new likelihood term for the new observation, the new design, and that gives us this updated posterior. The updated posterior defines a new conditional EIG, and from that updated posterior and that updated conditional EIG, we can choose the next um, best design, and we can just keep iterating this, and this will just keep generating new designs and outcomes for us. And so uh, just to really draw this home, we can go back uh, and look at that sort of location finding experiment again. And so at the first step, uh, we don't have a conditional EIG. We haven't observed anything yet. So we just optimize the conventional EIG to get the first design. And then we just sample an outcome. So here we chose this position pretty much bang in the middle um, was the best place to start off. Uh, and then given that we've got the color here as the signal and it's a, it's a reasonably weak signal, uh, but not too weak. Then uh, we've got this new observation. We have this a uh, new strength at that position. So we get an updated posterior. So we update our posterior P theta uh, given H1. 
And we can then use that updated posterior to define um, the conditionally IG, which is basically the same as using the normally IG, but where our prior is the old posterior. So it's just essentially a conventionally IG, the old posterior as our prior. And we can use that uh, to optimize and get the next uh, design points. So that might be this point here uh, for this particular example. Then we go in the observation, and this time we actually get a much stronger signal uh, in this position. So we've got much more information about the locations. And then we just simply iterate this process. Each time we optimize the conditional IG, sample an outcome, and update our posterior. And over time, it will sort of learn to carefully adapt uh, and pick up these points uh, quite carefully. And we end up uh, with some reasonably uh, useful and accurate looking uh, data as shown here. The last step is then potentially to sort of use this to sort of infer the location. So in some, in some sort of applications, we would just take this uh, and we would maybe just uh, use the data as our final objective. We wouldn't do anything more of it. Uh, but in other cases, we are explicitly trying to get some Bayesian analysis done and we're explicitly trying to get a posterior. And here we would just condition um, on all the data we've received so far. So we get this sort of final posterior given all our data, which is the same as the posterior given the full history. So uh, up to the end of the experiment. Uh, and of course, this is proportional to the prior times the product of the likelihoods, and we're done uh, with our experiment. Um, okay, so this is probably a, a good point again to, to uh, pause for any questions, uh, if there's anything from the room. Any questions? Is this uh, working? Yeah, uh, good. Any questions? No. Okay. okay. I'll just. I'll just go. Um, okay. So so far we've we've um, we, we've got a, a really quite potentially nice sort of uh, formalization and a, a nice framework uh, uh, to work with. But um, until I, I say very recently, um, these approaches saw very little use in practice. There's, there's a few sort of special cases, Bayesian optimization being one of the, the most clear cut ones, but most um, settings, th these were not seen as sort of practical approaches. And you could kind of say, uh, maybe four years ago, it wouldn't be un unusual to say that, okay, this, this kind of thing is a good idea, but I'm never gonna use it in practice because it, it's way too computation in uh, intensive. And it ends up usually being used for sort of problems that are only a few dimensions uh, or where they've got key things that can be done analytically. And it's often um, pretty slow even then. So we, we've essentially got a big sort of um, computational elephant um, in the room that essentially these are these are nice in practice, uh, sorry, nice in principle, uh, but difficult in practice because there's actually a massive uh, underlying computational cost we have to deal with. And that cost is, is, is really bad because it, the EIG is not just an intractable term. It, it's actually what's known as a doubly uh, intractable term. It's a lot worse than just having to sort of try and run inference or um, sort of normal uh, estimates of expectations. It's a lot worse than most of the things uh, we're used to dealing with. And the reason for that is that it, it's it's uh, what's sort of known as a nested expectation. So this, this posterior is intractable. So in general, for most problems, we're not going to know the posterior. So we have an intractable posterior. And in fact, we have to have the density of that. It's not even enough to say just generate MCMC samples. We have some density estimation of an intractable posterior, uh, which makes it particularly nasty. Then we have to say, well, actually, we need the entropy of that. Um, we don't just need it. We need its entropy. So that makes it even worse. Uh, but getting even worse than that, we need the expectation of that entropy. So it's not even a single entropy we're looking at. It's the expectation of multiple intractable uh, entropy. So each time we generate a new outcome, each time we generate a new y, we get a different um, posterior and a different entropy of that. And we get this essentially expectation of a function of an expectation that makes it incredibly difficult uh, to deal with. Um, so it's probably easiest to look at this uh, through what happens if we start actually sort of estimating it by Monte Carlo. So we, we can write the EIG in this form. This is the kind of uh, bold version of it. It's the expected uh, disagreement in predictions. So this is just a Bayes rule of the way we've been looking before. It's just a different form. Uh, of that EIG. So we've got the expectation and the joint of the log of the likelihood over um, the margin likelihood. And the natural thing to do would just be to sort of take a Monte Carlo estimate of that outer expectation. So we can just draw from that and we can then uh, go and make a Monte Carlo estimate of it. 
And what that Monte Carlo estimate will look like will be some sort of average over some empirical samples of log of the likelihood over this marginal likelihood. And what we see is we hit a problem, which is that that marginal likelihood is itself intractable. We can't actually evaluate that marginal likelihood. So each one of our Monte Carlo samples is an intractable problem. And what's worse, each one is a different problem. It's not a single intractable quantity we need to do. Each sample yn, each time we draw a new sample in a Monte Carlo estimate, we're making a new intractable estimation problem. And that's just going to cause the computation to explode because we need to take more samples on the outside to have that sort of best expectation converge. But the more samples we take on the outside expectation, the more estimation problems we effectively now have to solve in this inner problem. We have to do lots and lots and lots of these marginal likelihood um, estimations. And that's just going to very, very quickly um, get uh, extremely uh, expensive. And it's this fact that each of them is different. We have to do it differently each time that is really causing uh, that explosion. So the, the conventional way uh, to do this, um, other than um, sort of cheap heuristics like a Laplace approximation or something, uh, the sort of the only kind of more statistically uh, consistent or principled way uh, of doing this was to use what's known as a nested uh, Monte Carlo estimator. And that is simply to basically in, uh, introduce a Monte Carlo estimator for this second intractable term, uh, but where that's a separate Monte Carlo estimator for each instance of it. So remember, we've got this yn, each time that yn is different, we've got a different Monte Carlo sample. And for each of those, we can introduce uh, their own Monte Carlo estimator. So we can have this sort of sum over n, and we've got log, we've got the likelihood, the likelihood's fine, uh, but then we've got this extra embedded uh, Monte Carlo estimator, this nested uh, Monte Carlo estimator inside um, the, the other one, uh, where we have to sort of draw extra samples um, to estimate this inner term. We're drawing extra sort of samples um, from p theta. And the problem is, is that this can't be this can't be collapsed. This log is creating a nonlinearity. I can't do the sort of normal Monte Carlo trick of just sort of moving this sum to the outside and just jointly uh, estimating everything. This double intractability, this nested thing means that I, I can't do that. I have to have this, this, this nesting. And that means that the cost is, is very large. It means it's an n times n cost because each time I make an out, a sample in the outer bit, I have a new estimation in the inner bit. And so I have this horrible um, exploding cost. And that exploding cost inevitably gives me really poor convergence rates. So uh, we showed about four years ago that, that these things converge at a rate um, t to the minus one over three in total cost t, uh, and that compares to t to minus a half for conventional Monte Carlo estimation. So there's a sort of a fundamentally slower uh, convergence rate that's going to happen these, uh, that's going to make them uh, horribly efficient. And so this this creates a big bottleneck, and I think is one of the big reasons uh, that, that uh, for a long time the, these sort of Bayesian experimental design things uh, didn't see much use because they're just these horrible uh, things to work with, uh, at least when we're using these sort of more naive uh, estimation methods. So if we're going to use them, we need to sort of have some way of getting around it. We need to see, start thinking about how can we get around that double intractability? How can we um, try and get things uh, to work in spite of it? And for that, we need to sort of start thinking about, okay, what is it that's so inefficient uh, about this? And uh, what we're essentially doing is we're, we're doing mar marginal likelihood estimates. And uh, so we can think about this as kind of a functional thing where for different sort of samples of outcomes, each time we sample an outcome, uh, we have a different marginal likelihood estimate. And when we do an estimate Monte Carlo, we're essentially doing each of these from scratch. So each time we have a new outcome, uh, we have a different marginal likelihood and we're just doing a new separate estimator um, for that new marginal likelihood. So this, this nested uh, estimate here is different each time and we're just making a separate um, estimate for it each time. And it, what that will look like is we'll have some sort of true thing that's like this. It's kind of, it's a, it's a density in Y. Uh, and uh, we've just got these sort of crosses where each cross uh, is independently generated. And the first thing we might think about is, well, can we sort of co-estimate um, all of these? Can we use the same set of samples uh, and just estimate them all at the same time? And it's true that we could do that, but it wouldn't really help um, because it's not the number of samples that we're generating that's really the bottleneck. It's that double summation. It's even if we share the samples, we still have to calculate this double summation and it's still going to be horribly uh, expensive. But what we can do instead is we can look at this and we can say, well, this is essentially a regression problem. 
we have something that each time we get a y we get a noisy estimate out and the thing we're actually trying to learn is a function because if we have that function each time we get a new outer monte carlo estimate we already know how to evaluate it and we what we care about is is the correlation between these if, if we have close y's those close y's will have similar marginal likelihoods and so what we really want to do is think about can we regress can we learn a regressor in, in more more precisely a density estimator actually um, that figures out uh, this and uses these sort of noisy evaluations um, of um, uh, the marginal likelihood to sort of learn uh, its functional form. So what we want to do is, as I said, is we want to treat this as a stochastic regression problem and learn a functional approximation. And that means that we're going to take this, this marginal likelihood of p y given chi and we're going to approximate it with q phi of y given chi. We're just going to directly try and learn some approximation by learning some parameters of that approximation. Once we've done that, we can just plug that straight in. We can then say, well, our marginal likelihood estimator, uh, sorry, marginal likelihood, oh, not marginal, um, uh, I mean, uh, EIG is just uh, approximately equal to a Monte Carlo estimate of the log of the ratio of the likelihood and this learnt uh, marginal um, likelihood estimator is we're just plugging this in. So we've learned something, then we plug it in. And once we've plugged it in, we've just got a normal Monte Carlo estimator. So this thing is then much, much cheaper um, to work with. It's going to have lots of other benefits as well, because it's going to be unbiased estimate of um, the expectation when we did the replacement. And so it's got lots of uh, beneficial properties. And we're going to do this this way, and we're going to share information. So the key is that by learning this regression, we're sharing information between those estimates rather than doing them from scratch each time. And what turns out is that this is even better than it might at first seem, because it turns out that we've actually implicitly defined a variational bound. And it's not quite exactly the same as the variational bounds you'd see in variational inference, uh, but it's quite close and it has most of the properties you actually want. So if we look at the expectation of this, this estimator, it's just the expectation of the joint of the log of the um, likelihood over um, the thing we've just learned. And what we find is that actually, no matter what approximation we have, it is always going to give us an estimate that is large, uh, uh, sorry, an estimate expectation uh, that is larger than the true uh, mutual information, the true EIG. So the minimizer, it turns out, of um, this term on the right is when Q phi y given um, chi is exactly the true marginal likelihood. And so by minimizing this term on the right, we can actually learn. Um, a good approximator for thing on the left. So in the same way in variational inference, uh, you would learn your posterior approximation. The better you make your posterior approximation, the tighter um, your elbow becomes. Here we're doing it the other way. We're minimizing, but the better uh, marginal likelihood approximator is, the tighter we're getting to the actual EIG. And so we can actually use this as a mechanism to approximate that EIG by doing this minimization, uh, having this tight um, variational bound uh, that we can get through this optimization. And in fact, this thing's not unique. There's actually quite a few different ways to do it. Um, so this one we've just done is something we call uh, the marginal uh, variational bound, and it's an upper bound. But you can get uh, other ones by, for example, approximating the posterior. Uh, so this is something that's called the, the barber agikoff bound, uh, and it's, it sort of crops up in uh, information theory. And uh, it turns out that basically if we take the posterior, and we instead replace the posterior with some sort of inference network, some amortized uh, posterior approximation. This is actually now a lower bound um, on uh, the uh, expected information gain. So any posterior approximation will give us a lower bound estimate, an underestimate um, of the true, um, uh, true EIG. And so this time we can maximize this guy and learn this, this maximization uh, as a mechanism of doing the estimation. We can even actually sort of construct bounds uh, that are themselves consistent. Um, so if we go back and we take the NMC estimator from before, the NMC estimator actually turns out to be a value bound in itself. It's actually an upper bound. It turns out that the NMC always overestimates uh, the expected information gain. It's guaranteed an expectation to overestimate uh, the information gain. I mean, you can use that uh, to formulate bounds as well. I mean, in fact, we can make them even cleverer uh, because instead of just sort of um, doing prior sampling, um, for our expectation of the marginal likelihood. Uh, we can introduce an important sampling estimate. So we can introduce, again, a posterior approximation 
and use this time this posterior approximation um, to make uh, a marginal likelihood estimate by important sampling. And then if we take the expectation of this guy, this, this estimator, that's again an upper bound, but now an upper bound that we can make tighter and tighter and tighter. As this M goes to infinity, it's actually gonna be uh, exactly tight. Uh, and so we can control the tightness of this bound. And that's particularly important remembering that originally what we want to do is get an estimate of this. Um, so usually in variation inference, the ultimate aim is to learn the posterior approximation. Here it's actually the sort of uh, the marginal likelihood uh, equivalent, which is the EIG that we want to learn. We want to learn this term that we're bounding. And so getting that bound tight is particularly uh, important. Uh, another interesting thing we can actually do um, is um, here we, we're actually using separate samples in NMC um, for the likelihood term and what we're using to estimate the marginal likelihood. Uh, but it turns out we can actually break that. We can actually include them. We can do something that seems wrong and basically double use uh, one of our samples, essentially. And if we double use one of our samples, though, it, it turns out this gives you now a lower bound instead of an upper bound. So it flips the sign here uh, and gives you something that's guaranteed to underestimate um, the actual tumor mutual information. Uh, and that gives us something called the adaptive contrastive estimation bound and, uh, or the ACE bound. And we call it that because it's actually a generalization of the bounds that people use in contrastive learning. So like SimClear and those kind of things use uh, exactly one of the bounds, uh, this particular bound of this form. And it turns out we're going to make this, this lower bound. And what's particularly nice is the fact that we've got both upper and lower bounds now. And if we've got both upper and lower bounds, we can kind of actually get these sort of guaranteed uh, bounds on exactly where uh, the true EIG is. So we can actually get a notion of how good um, our estimates are uh, and how well all of this is doing. And just to sort of reiterate how this is working again, we're working again in this, this notion um, of uh, variational distributions and, and we've got these, these bounds and what we're essentially doing is we're tightening the bounds as we train those inference networks. So um, for these posterior approximations, the gap in the bound turns out to actually be the KL or the expected KL divergence uh, between the true posterior and our approximation. So when we optimize these, we're just sort of optimizing uh, these uh, uh, as uh, minimizing that gap, sorry, between uh, the EIG uh, and their bound. And so they're giving us these surrogates uh, that we can go and work with. And uh, what's important to appreciate with this is that um, usually when you, you deal with variational methods, they're kind of always kind of a biased method uh, and usually we want to do Monte Carlo if we want low bias, but we want things to be slow. And we do variational inference if we want things to be quick, uh, but potentially biased. And that trade-off actually doesn't apply here. Um, the variational approaches can just actually be fundamentally better. Uh, and the reason for that is that nested Monte Carlo methods, unlike Monte Carlo methods, are actually biased. Um, it's, it's pretty much impossible to actually remove the bias uh, using Monte Carlo approaches. Uh, and that bias comes from a kind of a Jensen's inequality that we have a, an estimator of a function of an estimator and that function of an estimator is not equal in expectation to the function of the expectation. And because we've always got this bias, we don't have this normal trade-off and we can actually get these variational approaches to be sort of fundamentally better uh, ways of doing the estimation. And in fact, they can give you sort of these, these faster convergence rates. You can actually get back to kind of Monte Carlo convergence rates of T to minus a half uh, when we use these variational approaches uh, rather uh, than working with uh, Nestor Monte Carlo. And in what we see with this in practice uh, is that they can be very, very useful. So this is a, a sort of a relatively toy uh, problem. Uh, and the, at the top, uh, we're looking at the sort of convergence in our EIG estimate as a function of real time. Uh, and this one at the top is just using Nestor Monte Carlo. So it, it takes zero variational steps uh, and then just sort of uses that. Um, but with the methods, what we can do is we can kind of train these variational bounds for a bit. Uh, and then using that training of the variational bound uh, gives us a way uh, of really speeding things up. So in particular, what we can do is we can work with this sort of variational NMC bound as a mechanism to sort of train um, some sort of proposal and then go back, use that proposal in the NMC estimator. And what we find is we can get much, much uh, more accurate estimates for a given computational budget by basically spending some of the time training uh, a variational approximation and then some of our time uh, doing Monte Carlo submission with um, that trained thing. Uh, 
Uh, and the reason this, this can be much more effective is, is that we're moving from something uh, multiplicative to something additive. So when we did Nesta Monte Carlo, each time we had um, a new um, sort of estimate, we had to, uh, sorry, a new outer sample, we had to have a new inner estimate. Um, and so we had this multiplicative cost, it was order n, n in its cost. But here is order n times, uh, so n plus n. We spend some time uh, learning our approximation and then sometimes sampling once we've learned uh, that approximation. So we're learning something, then deterministically replacing what we've got out, or potentially going and looking at an NMC estimate. Both of these are fine, but the key is to learn something up front and learn something in a way that if it would converge, it would actually converge to the truth. Once we've learned that, we then go and use that uh, to do that estimation as a separate step. And so we have an additive cost and therefore these faster um, convergence rates. Okay, um, so I think that's a good point to stop um, for this uh, first uh, talk, and I'll, I'll come back in the second half and we'll, we'll look a bit more about the, the optimization um, of this. So, so far, we've really only been looking at um, the estimation of the EOG. We've not actually gone into how, how do we actually choose designs? How do we actually uh, optimize for these things? So we'll come back and we'll look at that uh, in, in the second half, um, but it's probably good to, to ask for some questions before we um, all uh, go off on the break. Good. Uh, do we have any questions before the break? Uh, one question. Hi, hello. This is Priscilla. Hi. I was wondering how your methods compare with, um, instead of using a Markov method, a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Because in this way, you will avoid to compute the evidence at all. So I was missing here any comparison with the Markov chains uh, Monte Carlo approaches. Uh, you simply can't use Markov chain Monte Carlo. It, it, it's not, you're not doing inference. You, you're doing something different to inference. So you need, you need either a density estimate of the posterior or a marginal likelihood estimate to do anything. And so you you are, you just straight up cannot use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, they, they, they're, they're not well. The only I suppose you could you could use post hoc marginal likelihood estimates on Monte Carlo chains, but um, but you, those tend not to work very well. So it, it all of this is actually kind of um, relatively tangential to kind of inference methods. It, it's as I said, it's it's not a trade off of like Monte Carlo versus variational inference. It's a it's a fundamentally kind of different formulation of the problem that is is actually less um, involved in the exact uh, estimation approach, but in basically moving from a piecewise estimation to a regressional based estimation. Uh, and that's where the changes are. Uh, but th there is no sort of MCMC comparison. You just can't, you simply can't use it. Uh, 